Cabernet tends to be the sort of Errol Flynn of the great varieties. The most expensive beer in history. People will turn around to me and say, oh, I'm just making gin while I wait for my whiskey to get ready. Because wine is an adventure. Conventional winemakers who just condemn all natural wine as faulty. The prestigious title of Saki Samurai. Looking at whiskey in more of an artful culinary way. They kind of look at it as a novelty more than anything. The guy from the rock bands is making wine. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson, and this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine, and spirits, and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Wolf Blass is undoubtedly one of Australia's most iconic and acclaimed wine brands. The company conceived by German immigrant Wolfgang Blass in 1966 has received more than 10,000 medals and trophies globally for its wines. We're joined this episode by chief winemaker Chris Hatcher, who has been with Wolf Blass since 1987 and has played an integral role in the continued evolution of its wines. This is a special episode of the Drinks Adventures podcast produced with the support of Wolf Blass. The occasion is the launch of the 2021 Wolf Blass Luxury Collection, comprising five reds and one white, showcasing South Australia's premier wine regions. And I started this interview by asking Chris how these new release wines would compare stylistically to those Wolf Blass was making when Chris joined the business 34 years ago. It goes back to vineyards in reality. So when Wolf started off and when I first came into the industry, we didn't really have professional viticulturalists and the reality was people were growing grapes in all the wrong places. They were trying to grow Chardonnay in hot irrigated areas. And the big development has really been an understanding of what varieties do well in what regions. And, and that's a maturity of our industry. And it's something obviously Europe's had for centuries, but you know our industry is relatively young compared to them. So from that development in vineyards, um, so when I first started, when, when Wolf first started, we had to use a lot of oak and winemaking influence to get the flavour profiles that we're looking for. And the thing that Wolf brought to the Australian wine industry was really making styles that were very, red wines in particular, that were very plush on the palate, very approachable, softer tannin structure. So wines that were really uh, enjoyable to drink and didn't need a lot of bottle ageing. Uh, so he used a lot of oak and, and techniques with oak to achieve that. Now today, we can achieve that in the vineyard, so we don't need the inputs of as much oak and as much, um, I guess, w- wine making, not trickery, but uh, using different techniques to uh, achieve the, the style we want. So from my point of view, over, over the journey, and I think, you know, if you look at the history of Wolf Blass, it very much reflects the Australian wine industry. So in the early days, made big uh, flavoursome wines, but used uh, th- other things other than the vineyard itself, where today we still have that same structure on the palate. So we're still looking for those softer tannins and, and integrated tannins and, and nice flesh on the, the palate. But we're able to get that through the vineyards and our sourcing of fruit. So we don't need all the oak. So the, 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 the bouquet or the nose is much more vibrant, fresh, bright, much more reflective of, of the, the fruit in the vineyard and less of winemaking uh, inputs and us trying to make the wine or add to the fruit characters that we've got. So I think it's been a good period for winemaking in Australia and I think the style that we're making now is in overall very similar to what Wolf made back in the late 60s, early 70s, but with the context of much better fruit, much more vibrant and much more varietal and I think for consumers, wines that are very interesting. So yeah, going back to the wines that you were making in, in those earlier years, what was the shortcomings of that fruit? In a lot of cases, it was overripeness because it was in the warmer areas. So we tended to get riper fruit characters and less flavour, which almost sounds a contradiction, but it's not. If you have a warmer climate, you tend to get the sugar races up to be quite high and the fruit flavour doesn't develop. And that's why we go to cooler regions where it slows the sugar development down and the fruit 
can mature as the fruit characters. So you get that good combination of the fruitiness of the grape plus the sugar, where in, in the warmer areas, you tend to get sugar without the flavour. So you tend to leave it on the vine for longer periods. You get higher alcohols and quite often the fruit will start to uh, what we call bag up. It starts to lose moisture and you tend to get those sort of overripe, what we call dead fruit characters, which I don't like at all. I, uh, my whole approach to winemaking is freshness and vibrance and, and, and expressing the fruit characters and all of the things that we had that we were fighting against in the early days were really over-ripeness and lack of freshness. And so what would have been, you know, some of the regions or vineyards that you were sourcing from back then that wouldn't be considered suitable for Wolf Blast these days? The irrigated areas of South Australia and Victoria, New South Wales, so the warmer uh, regions around the Murray, we don't take well, we virtually don't take any for wolf blasts um, because they don't suit our styles. And in areas that even wolf sourced from when he first started, areas like Langhorn Creek and the Barossa McLaren Vale, the, the quality of viticulture has improved so much that we're getting a much different fruit profile to what he would have got back in the 1970s. So, you know, we look at Things like mulching, so putting mulch in the vineyard, same as people do in their gardens to retain moisture. But we look at it virtually by vine. So in some region, uh, some parts of the vineyard where you, you're more stony, so you've got stone underneath, you need a lot of mulch to keep the moisture in there because the soil, there's not much soil. And in other parts of the vineyard, it might be deeper soil, so less um, uh, mulching. And the same with irrigation we match the irrigation to suit the individual parts of a vineyard instead of approaching the vineyard as a whole. And that's been an enormous improvement in, um, in overall quality. So say here in the Barossa, you could have a vineyard that without managing it correctly, you might have A grade, so the very best fruit in that vineyard, and C grade in the same vineyard and the same variety, which is more commercial uh, level of quality. Now, being able to manage the vineyard as far as crop level per vine by irrigation, mulching, pruning, all of those sorts of things, we're able to get a much more even crop and then get higher quality and more depth and more structure in the wine. So it's not only just the regions that we've changed, but also our vineyard practices, much more professional, much better understanding of you know, how a vine grows and, and why vines in the same vineyard are different. Maybe moving through the wines uh, one by one, um, starting, with, starting with the Chardonnay, um, you know, Wolf Blast is obviously much better known for its red wines, but Chardonnay has become an increasing focus in recent years. Oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you a funny story that Wolf, when I first started, he said to me, uh, Chardonnay, that's going to be an overnight wonder. It's never going to last. How wrong can you be? <laughs> but good Chardonnay, and, th and this goes back to what I was talking about, viticulture before. Chardonnay has changed dramatically in Australia. In fact, I personally think it's been the biggest single change of any variety that we make across everything within Australia, and not just at Wolf Blast, I mean, as, a, as an industry. We used to make big, fat, horrible, over-oak Chardonnays. And uh, today, going to cool climate regions, so uh, the grey label Chardonnays from Adelaide Hills and at the, the very high part of the Adelaide Hills, so it's at about you know, 600, 650 metres above sea, much more elegant, much more stylish, and we don't have to have as much oak influence and winemaking influence in the wine. So it's very similar to what I was saying about uh, how the industry's changed. And a, a lot of that drive has actually been the fact that we're exporters. I remember going to the UK, you know, 20 years ago with Chardonnay and, and buyers saying to me, you'll never sell that here. People are used to drinking Burgundy and, Bur and Australian Chardonnay doesn't taste like Burgundy. And so as an industry, we've really had a good hard look at ourselves and, and, and changed. And, and I think it's a credit to our industry that we are prepared to you know, be self-critical 
and uh, and change. And particularly at Wolf Blast, so I, I think, you know, it's part of our DNA. It's part of what uh, Wolf started off uh, and, and me having worked with him for so long, I understand that you must always think of the consumer. At the end of the day, we're making wines for consumers um, and we need to make styles that they like drinking, not necessarily what we we uh, appreciate. So <clears throat> Chardonnay was one of those things that, it, you know, we thought we were doing the right thing, but in fact, we weren't. We were making very ordinary wine. And um, so <clears throat> I think the, the, the Grey Label is a very good example of, of modern Australian Chardonnay. It's got finesse, it's got style. It's a nice wine to drink by itself, but also goes extremely well with food. The old style Chardonnay certainly weren't great drinks by themselves. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm really happy with the wine and, uh, and I think I'm very happy with the, uh, our industry that we actually make uh, world-class Chardonnay now. What sort of evolution have we seen in that Chardonnay just in the last few years? You know, there's been quite a lot of talk um, about how the pendulum swung too far to the other direction of those sort of super lean and bonesy, you know, kind of sulfitic type yep. wines. Where were you trying to position this wine and how's that changed? Yeah, well, I think what you say is absolutely correct. And the same thing happened with Riesling, uh, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago that they became winemakers' wines, so far too lean, too acid, and really, um, as an industry with Chardonnay, we talked about, oh, these wines are great to bottle age. Well, yes, they are, but people don't bottle age wines necessarily that much these days. So what we try to do with Wolf Blast with all of our wines is have make a style that's good now, um, that's very approachable, very drinkable now, but will also age well. And I think the Chardonnay is a good example of that. It's got lovely depth of flavour. It's not big, it's not heavy, but it's got intensity of fruit. And then, uh, so it, it makes it good now, but it will improve with age. In fact, <clears throat> we have a, a gold label range of the Chardonnay in that. And I had a 2017 uh, a couple of days ago and it was fantastic and looked like it was a year old. Um, so. That's the thing that we've been able to do is change the style, change the sourcing of the fruit and be able to make wines that are, are both good now but, but will age well. And certainly our old style Chardonnays, you couldn't age them, you know, 12 months of age and they were looked like they were about 10 years old. Now the Grey Label Cabernet Shiraz, has that been a 100% Langhorne Creek wine from the very beginning? Absolutely. It's a fascinating story. So this is the very first wine that Wolf actually made under his own label. So it was 1967 was the first year. We talk about 1966 as the first year of Wolf Blast, which it actually, it is because after he, he made his Grey Label, he realised he needed a wine that was readily available and he developed Yellow Label and the first vintage, 1966, he actually bought wines for that first blend. So 67 is, is a really important wine for us, the, the Grey Label, from Langhorne Creek. It's been made every year from Langhorne Creek, uh, Cabernet Shiraz. Uh, the interesting uh, thing with it is that uh, the grower that provided the first fruit in 1967 to Wolf for the, the Grey Label Cab Shiraz, his grandson, now still provides uh, fruit off that vineyard to us. So it's been continuous since uh, 1967. Now, obviously we have other growers in our own vineyards as well, um, but it's a very important wine within our portfolio. And it really is the hallmark of what Wolf the Man really did, which was look outside the square, look at the flavour profile and Langhorne Creek produces Cabernet that I guess there are two styles in Australia. There's the, the Margaret River Coonawarra style, which is what I'd call more classical. It's more Bordeaux-like. And then you've got areas like Langhorne Creek or even in good years, Barossa, which are, are more opulent, softer tannin structures, lovely velvet uh, structure through the middle, uh, but still very varietal, but quite different to, uh, to Margaret River or Coonawarra. Um, and I, I personally think they're a little bit like, say, a Margaret River or a Coonawarra Cabernet Shiraz. They've got more depth, they've got more structure on the palate and more plushness. Now, the reason it's a Cabernet Shiraz, 
I guess there are a couple of reasons. I love Cabernet Shiraz, and I think it is one of the best uh, red wines made in Australia, Cabernet Shiraz, uh, very historic, uh, uh, and we've been making it virtually since day one of red wines in Australia. But it really makes a, uh, a good style. And with Cabernet, Cabernet is very vintage dependent. So in a cool year, it's very varietal, but it's quite lean on the palate. So there's no great depth through the mid palate and it's quite firm. And to be able to blend uh, Shiraz with the Cabernet, you can build the plushness and the depth from the Shiraz. So the Cabernet almost becomes the bones and the Shiraz the body. So it it really is a good combination. In a warmer year, the Cabernet is richer, so we use less Shiraz. So it, it's very uh, vintage dependent. But I think from a, from a consumer's point of view, it's a wine that we can make consistently high quality every single year by being able to vary the, the percentages of Cabernet Shiraz to, uh, to come up with that uh, classic style of grey label. You can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel like I'm seeing more 100% Langhorn Creek wines on the market from reputable labels uh, in the region sort of coming to the fore a bit more in a similar way to how McLaren Vale probably did a couple of decades earlier. You know, he must have been sort of ahead of his time with um, really championing a 100% Langhorn Creek wine 50 odd years ago. Exactly. Now. No, you're spot on. Um, so when I came into the industry in the mid 70s, there was a lot of Langhorn Creek fruit growing and the only people that really used it on the label was uh, Sultrans Metala or, or Stonyfell Metala, um, which is a single vineyard wine from Langhorn Creek and Wolf Blass. And there was a lot of fruit grown in Langhorn Creek, but most of it went into to other blends like Penfolds or you, know, you name them, Orlando. Other companies used the fruit but didn't declare the region at all and, and it would have ended up in, in larger blends. What's happened in recent years is people have seen uh, what Wolf did with, with Langhorn Creek, seen their success. <clears throat> in fact, he's one of the first patrons of Langhorn Creek. So the growers uh, made him a patron of Langhorn Creek because he was so important on promoting it. And so today you've got a lot of smaller makers uh, in the region that have a cellar door and, and set up their own businesses and also large companies that are actually using Langhorn Creek and declaring it. So it's become uh, quite a, a, a growing region as far as its uh, uh, consumers knowing about it. And certainly uh, we've always promoted it uh, as an important part of our portfolio. But uh, certainly there are a lot of other companies that are doing the same now. And consumers love that style of wine. It really, it's high quality. So Grey Label's uh, what we call A-grade within our group. Uh, it's A-grade fruit, uh, high quality, um, but re really approachable. It's very uh, classic Wolf Blass. And Wolf's view from day one was whenever he sold a wine, it should be ready to drink. And I think these are classics in that. They're ready to drink. They will improve with age. And certainly I've seen back to that 67 and it still looks fantastic. So <clears throat> they age exceptionally well. But as uh, release wines, when they're released as younger wines, they're still very plush and very drinkable. Moving on to the Black Label, this is obviously one of Australia's iconic wines. How does the 18 compare with previous vintages? Yeah, no, the 18's fabulous. It, it's quite funny, uh, as an industry, the even-numbered vintages tend to be the slightly better vintages, not that we get huge variations, but they tend to be slightly better. The, the one interesting thing with Black Label is we've made it every year since 1973. So 73 was the first vintage. Uh, <clears throat> and in 73, Wolf selected the best barrels of his cellar and blended them together and made Black Label. And, and that wine won the Jimmy Watson. And then he fo followed up with the 74 and then the 75 vintage. Same thing, selection of the best barrels <clears throat> and won the Jimmy Watson. So it was, was always a blended wine. It was always uh, Cabernet and Shiraz uh, as the predominant varieties. Um, 
and the regions were always Langhorne Creek, McLaren Vale, Langhorne Creek. But all of the varieties and all of the regions varied from year to year because uh, it was about a taste sensation. It wasn't about, say, like our Platinum Shiraz, which is a single vineyard wine, and as winemakers we're looking to express the vineyard. Black Label really is about making a style of wine. So it's taking individual vineyard components and the quality of those components and then bringing them together to make the ultimate Black Label. So each year we're able to um, make a much more consistent wine and a wine that uh, looks like Black Label by varying the volume. So in a lesser vintage, we'll make less volume. In a better vintage, obviously, more volume. And then, as I said, with the, the uh, Grey Label Cab Shiraz, the Cabernet percentage and the Shiraz vint- uh, percentage will vary depending on a cool vintage or a warm vintage. And the same with whether it's uh, we use Barossa Cabernet or Langhorn Creek Cabernet, uh, it will vary on what the uh, the dynamics of the vintage are. So it's it's we look really about trying to be as consistent and stylistically uh, consistent uh, year in year out. Now that doesn't mean it hasn't changed. Obviously, it has changed, and as I was talking about before, as the industry's matured. Uh, and as winemakers have matured, we were using less oak and we were allowing the vineyards to, to express themselves more. So it has changed, but that overall structure on the palate is the same. And it was fascinating for me uh, when we released the 2012, which was the 40th vintage. I actually went back through the show record to see how successful it had been because I knew Black Label had been one of the really successful wines in Australia. And it averaged for the 40 vintages, and that, that it still continued on since then, <clears throat> it averaged over seven gold medals and I think three and a half trophies for every single vintage for those 40 plus vintages, which blew my mind that, I mean, winning three or four gold medals in one vintage is a great thing to do, but to do it every vintage over 40 years is, is quite fascinating. But the thing that really interested me most out of that was that Black Label stayed relevant to each decade over that period. And certainly wines that are being paid in wine competitions today are quite different to what they were in 1973 because we've evolved. But Black Label's been able to evolve along with with the industry trends. And I feel very proud as a winemaker that we've been able to do that with Black Label and keep it consistent but relevant to uh, to the modern world. And certainly the 2018 is a wine that certainly is a great drink now, but it will age incredibly well. And what we did in when we released those, um, the 2012, we looked at every single vintage back to 73. And it was quite interesting. Uh, we did it mainly with journalists and they were arguing whether it was the 73, 79 or 98, which were the best three wines. And I thought that is a great compliment to a wine that's iconic, that that still uh, ages exceptionally well uh, and still relevant to the modern world. And are there any other varieties hiding in that mix? I, I haven't got the tasting note in front of me, but it's labelled Cabernet Shiraz, but I was just wondering if there's anything else underneath that. Cab Shiraz Malbec, uh, in most of the more, it's, since about 2002, we've, we've tried in most years to get Malbec in the blend. It doesn't always make it, but most years there'll be a small percentage of Malbec and and I love Malbec. It gives great intensity of colour and um, it really helps the structure of the wine. So yeah, capture as Malbec. And as I said, if you ask me what the percentage of Cabernet and Shiraz and Malbec are, I wouldn't have a clue because that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is it tastes like Black Label. And so, to me, the percentages aren't necessarily that important. Looking at the platinum label wines, how long has Wolf Blast been associated with the Medlands Vineyard? So we actually, um, Medlands Vineyard dates back to very early times, like the 1870s. So it was a vineyard and also an orchard. And interestingly, uh, William Salter's son, so Saltram, his son was one of the ones that developed it back in, in the, uh, the old days. So quite a historic vineyard. Um, 
We in, we actually took uh, ownership of it when we bought Tolly's Padere back in the early uh, 1990s. So we've had it for quite some time and certainly have put a lot of um, uh, redevelopment, look, uh, improve the, the quality and consistency of the older vines and we've also planted some new vines. But uh, it's a, a really interesting vineyard. It's in what I'd call the central part of the Barossa Valley. So it's in uh, the parish of Dorian. So quite a famous region. And it actually sits on the banks of the North Parra River. So um, the Parra River, or well, North Parra River, it's, it's right up to the, to the edge of the river. And it's quite a unique little microclimate because the North Parra goes up to Eden Valley. And um, at night, the cold air from Eden Valley siphons down the, the, the riverbed and uh, impacts the, the microclimate in that vineyard, as it does along all of the vineyards on that stretch. The vineyard right next to it used to be owned by uh, Sepult, and uh, we now own that vineyard. But back in the 1980s, probably the best Cabernet made from the Barossa, yeah, I think it was in 1985, it won every wine competition around Australia, was actually the Sepult Dorian Cabernet, and it was off the vineyard right next door to this. So it's quite a unique little uh, area. Um, generally, you would think, oh, central Barossa is going to be warmer, um, and it, it's got this lovely combination of warmer during the day and cooler at night, so it, it gets that uh, nice balance of not racing the sugar, uh, but getting the, 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 the ripeness and the flavour development in line with, with the sugar. And you mentioned about how, you know, Cabernet can make great wines in the Barossa in good years. Yep. Um, was 18 a good Cabernet year? It was, absolutely. And, in fact... I'm surprised how consistent the Dorian or the, the Medlands vineyard in Dorian, how consistent the Cabernet is. And I think a lot of it's got to do with that, that market climate, but it's something we've been working really hard on. So the Shiraz, the first vintage uh, was 1998. So we've had Cabernet there, but we've done a lot of work on what I was talking about before, getting an even crop, getting a balanced vineyard so that we could get the consistency of the Cabernet. And that's why we haven't released it in, in uh, the past, is that we we couldn't guarantee that we were going to be consistent year in, year out with the quality. But now we're very confident that even in those slightly warmer vintages, it's still going to be very good because of where it is. And, and you know, the, the more you know, I learn in the wine business, the more I realise I don't know because you quite often have... <laughs> You presume things that, oh, well, it's in the central part of the Barossa. Cabernet is not necessarily going to do very well there. But actually, when you, you distill it down and look at the microclimate and look at, you know, the impacts of everything around it, it actually is a good area for, for Cabernet. So, yeah, and I must say, up the other place in the Barossa for Cabernet is up on the, the eastern uh, slopes of the, the, the Barossa Hills up around Saltram, Angustin through there. There's some lovely Cabernet uh, through that area because, because again, it's cooler and you get that more even ripening. So you really, particularly with Cabernet, it's, it's much more, um, heat sensitive than say Shiraz. Uh, and so to, to get it right every year is more difficult and, and, uh, you really need the, a great site, a vineyard site, to, to make good Cabernet consistently in the area like the Barossa. I just realised we haven't talked about the, the grey label McLaren Vale Shiraz. Was there anything you wanted to touch on there? Yeah, I think McLaren Vale, and, and you mentioned it when we were talking about Langham Creek, McLaren Vale is really starting to get great recognition around uh, not just Australia but globally on how good the, uh, the Shiraz are. Very different to Barossa. So Barossa tend to be more muscular and a bigger, denser wines where McLaren Vale tends to be more elegant. That, and, and people think elegance, they mean light, they think lighter. It's not necessarily lighter, it's just it's more balanced and, and not as uh, uh, strong in, in, in flavour profile, but still has an incredibly good punch. <clears throat> and it's as a partnership with the, the grey label Cabernet Shiraz and then 
the Grey Label Shiraz being Langhorn Creek for the Cab Shiraz and McLaren Bale for the, um, the Shiraz. The two are a good combination in overall structure. If we had a Barossa Shiraz in with the Langhorn Creek, so we had two wines, but instead of McLaren Vale, it was Barossa, I don't think they would be you know, a, a good pairing. Um, I think you know if you're going to have a range like Grey Label, the wines need to be consistent in the overall styling of it, so McLaren Vale suits very well. The reason it's a little more uh, elegant and stylish than, say, a lot of Barossa is basically McLaren Vale is a beach suburb, uh, I mean, people go down there for, for their beach holidays uh, and it's it's right on the coast. So the sea has a big influence on moderating the temperature, so keeping it much more even. It gets uh, afternoon and evening sea breezes every day during summer, so it cools the vineyards down. So again, you don't get that rapid ripening. It It's nice and warm during the day to get the flavour profile growing, uh, uh, maturing, but cooler at night so it doesn't race, so it keeps the sugar and, and flavour in balance. So, yeah, I love McLaren Vale Shiraz. I love Barossa Shiraz as well, uh, obviously, because I live here in the Barossa, but McLaren Vale Shiraz is, is fantastic and different, and that's what I think Australian winemakers are becoming far more mature in the sense that we are quite happy to have difference. Everything doesn't need to look the same, and I think that's a really important thing about wine is uh, to look at different things, look at different styles and appreciate uh, the difference. Moving back on to Cabernet Shiraz blends, which we were talking about earlier, what's been the sort of you know, evolution that you've seen of market perception of those wines, which you know, were, were kind of considered a bit unfashionable, but of certainly having their time in the sun again at the moment, which is great to see? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting with wine consumers and winemakers, in a way, uh, it's a, a little bit similar. I think when you start um, tasting wines and getting really interested in wines, you start to be able to pick things. So you start to be able to pick Cabernet and, and Shiraz as being different. <clears throat> and then you start thinking, oh, well, I'll drink Cabernet or I'll drink Shiraz um, because I know the difference and I can see the difference. And it's almost like, well, I know my wine because I can pick out Cabernet or I can pick out Shiraz. And it's the same in a way as a winemaker, you try to express the purity of Cabernet or the purity of Shiraz in a wine when you first start off. And that's your main uh, objective is to get that purity. But I think as you mature as a wine taster, so a consumer, you start to see that bringing things together uh, might make a more interesting wine. So it's not just about being able to pick Cabernet from Shiraz, but it's being able to pick, you know, what's the best wine? You know, what's a great wine versus I can pick Cabernet or I can pick Shiraz? And the same as a winemaker, instead of just focusing on purity of fruit in Cabernet and purity of fruit in Shiraz, is how can I bring those two things together to actually make a better wine? And as a winemaker, you should always be trying to make a better wine than you did the previous year. And and that's the great thing about agriculture. You, you're always fighting against the elements, but <clears throat> improvement, continuous improvement, I think is absolutely important. And I think, again, as Australians, we are very good at doing that. We don't have a huge tradition that says in Burgundy, unfortunately, you can grow Shiraz, uh, you can grow Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and that's all you can make. Um, in Australia, we're very experimental as winemakers, and and so we can look at doing things uh, slightly differently. So yeah, I th I think from both consumers and winemakers, it's that maturity of being this wine is a better wine than either the Cabernet by itself or the Shiraz by itself. And, and that's really uh, why I think Cabernet Shiraz is uh, coming back into favour. If you go back in the early days in the industry, the reason they use Cabernet and Shiraz, there wasn't much Cabernet planted. So if you wanted a, uh, to make a reasonable volume of wine, you had to make a Cabernet Shiraz. You couldn't have just a straight Cabernet. But I think we learnt a lot from that era and uh, we can now apply that into the modern era of 
you know, how do we make the absolute best wine we can? And I, I just love Cabernet Shiraz. Uh, I think straight Cabernet is good, and it's not saying straight Cabernet is not good, and straight Shiraz is fantastic as well. Uh, but it's a really interesting combination, uh, Cabernet and Shiraz, and, and certainly people that um, collect wine are starting to look for Cabernet Shiraz. Um, and I think globally, people are starting to talk about all Actually, this is the Australian blend. This is the wine that's uh, really interesting out of Australia. So it's um, certainly getting a lot of kudos uh, all around the world. Fantastic, Chris. Well, it's been a really interesting chat and uh, I'm sure my listeners are, are going to be excited to try these luxury wines, which, which they should be. It's a really impressive lineup. Well, thank you, James, and thanks for the opportunity to have a chat. Uh, I've probably... Uh, rabbited on too much but uh, as, you, as you might get the impression I, I just love the industry and I love wine. The Wolf Blast 2021 Luxury Collection is now available direct from wolfblast.com The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au you can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.